Welcome back, everyone. It's November 19th, 2020. Um, our faculty guests were just talking about the state of the pandemic. And as you know, today we're going to be talking about the arts and the implications for the arts, the impact of the arts, and the legacies of the pandemic as we think forward about the arts. But it is a difficult, even dire moment in the course of the pandemic. I'm sure all of you saw that over the last day, over a quarter of a million Americans have now died. And that's just one element of the global pandemic. Um, we were talking about the hard stories that are current in the pandemic. And of course, the fact that right now, there is no clear um, national response to the pandemic going on and no clear strategy for the transition to new leadership in January. And one thing that I think we've learned about pandemics is that they take place in real time. They don't pause over a transition period and any delay in strategies and commitments and policies to address them creates more deaths, more infections, and continues to cripple our economy and to some degree, our great cultural institutions. And we'll be taking that issue up um, today. I have to say this has been a very important class as we plan for the course. And Ingrid and I were totally committed to bringing people who are thinking critically about the arts and the pandemic and have had such important roles in the arts to the course. And as I was thinking about this morning's class, it occurred to me, this is really quite unusual. We've heard from great basic scientists, immunologists and virologists, fantastic clinicians and people who are at the front lines of patient care. But our own conviction is that you can't examine a pandemic without looking closely at culture, arts, artistic production, their impact on creativity. And in my own work, which centered for a long time on aspects of the AIDS epidemic, um, one can't really study the AIDS epidemic without evaluating its art in terms of studio art and museums, in terms of performance, in terms of film and photography. So having had the opportunity to learn about AIDS through its art, we think it's crucial um, that we take up the questions that we will today. So let me turn it over to Ingrid to introduce our very distinguished um, guest faculty for today. Thank you so much, Alan, and thank you to our tremendous speakers. As Alan mentioned, I think we conceptualized this, particularly towards the end of the course, because obviously we didn't know what was going to be unfolding this fall, and we were eager to hear from our, from speakers, our speakers today to provide us with a perspective over the last kind of eight to nine months that they've had to face. And we really have some of the most esteemed leaders here at Harvard in, in the world of the arts, and we couldn't be more grateful. And we're eager to really engage in this discussion, particularly as Alan alluded to, how art and culture has evolved alongside this pandemic and how critical this is um, to, for ourselves as humans, as, as we all move forward. And I think, you know, as someone, as I, as you all know, I'm an infectious diseases physician. So my brain has been entirely in that space, but this is, critical piece of this course is how we think about ourselves holistically and who we are and how we define our humanity. And so I think um, our speakers today really embody that through their work. And we're thrilled to have, um, we'll have four speakers today. Um, so let me introduce them. I'm going to start with Professor Karthik Pandian. He's an assistant professor here at Harvard of Art, Film, and Visual Arts in the Department of Art, Film, and Visual Arts. And his work um, really spans from moving image and sculpture to performance. 
And he is really an artist who works across disciplines to, as, as has been described, unsettle the ground of history. And I love that description of his work. Um, he's had solo exhibitions at multiple um, leading institutions around the world, including the Whitney, um, the Midway Contemporary Art in Minneapolis and many other places globally. And we're thrilled to have him here and speak to us today, particularly as an artist who embodies a lot of this work through his art um, and the impact that this moment is really having across artistic communities. So we'll be eager to hear from him. Our second speaker today is Professor Diane Paulus. She is the Terry and Bradley Bloom Artistic Director of the American Repertory Theater here at Harvard. And she's also a professor of practice in the Department of Theater um, in English um, and is obviously a, a luminary in the field. We're so lucky to have her here at Harvard. She's a Tony Award winner. Um, and many of us have enjoyed the tremendous work that has come out of the ART that's gone on to Broadway um, in, many, in many different capacities. Um, I've had the great pleasure of seeing many of her incredible pieces of work here. And I think Professor Paulus um, obviously brings um, a very unique lens to the table for us today, particularly around how this pandemic has really impacted the, the live theater and live performance. That's again, such a critical aspect of, of what defines us. Um, and, and where are we now in this moment together as we explore this? So we're eager to hear from her. She was a leader really early on working with other people to conceptualize a pathway forward. So we'll be eager to have that conversation with her today. Our third speaker is um, Professor Sarah Lewis. She is a professor in the History of Art and Architecture Department and the Department of African and American Studies. Um, you can see we have a video of her here. She'll be joining us shortly. Um, she has um, wide ranging articles on race, contemporary art and culture, and they've been published widely in the New Yorker, New York Times and many other areas. And she's really a leader in thinking um, critically about the arts and, and the role that, um, again, we're thinking about conceptually in this class is that what role does the art and the production of art play in revealing important aspects of this pandemic and this bigger political moment. Um, and, and particularly the experience that we're having right now. And so we're going to be eager to hear from her when she joins us. And then our last speaker is um, Professor Martha Tedeschi. She assumed, uh, sorry, Professor Tedeschi, um, who um, assumed the leadership and the directorship of all of the Harvard Art Museums in July of 2016. She's a specialist in 19th century British and American art um, and has particularly written in depth about many great American artists, but she is really the steward of all of the wonderful art that we get to experience here across Harvard, across all of the tremendous museums. And, and as I was expressing to Professor Tedeschi, our, I, growing up, our son is growing up here in the city of Cambridge, gets to partake in some of the many joys of the variety of incredible art that we have available to us in this community. We're so lucky. And we're particularly eager to hear from her as someone who has directed all of these art museums, how this COVID pandemic moment has really been influencing our ability to experience and view these, this, these masterpieces. So four tremendous leaders, and we are eager to hear from them all. We will start today with Professor Pandian. Thank you. I wanna begin by expressing my gratitude for the black, indigenous, feminist, trans, queer activists, rioters, and care workers who are leading the resistance against white supremacy, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism, and are also leading us in the reimagination of old and new relations that will perhaps get us through this time. I teach art at Harvard, but I also live in a town called Harvard, Massachusetts, 25 miles west of Cambridge. And it's the unceded territory of the Nipmuc or freshwater people. Taking responsibility for these three acres of land last year 
has led me to center care in my life and work in ways that have nourished and challenged me as an artist. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge the women in my life who have taught me what care is, what it feels like, especially my mother, Lalitha, and my partner, Paige. Their practices are radical and seen. Last summer, I'm just gonna go into a keynote here. <clears throat> Last summer, a rabbit gave birth to a litter of bunnies in the flower bed just outside our door. I did my best to prevent our dog, Tula, from discovering them, but found her one day, having killed all but one of them. I panicked and took the only surviving rabbit to a wild animal clinic 25 miles away, but it too perished. I buried the rest in our yard. Three weeks ago, Paige and I buried our beloved Tula. She died at the age of eight. Eight years that she gave us and we gave her in a relationship of reciprocal care. It hurts. I was up all that night making her a casket in the studio, but the rocks in the site we chose wouldn't make space for it. So we buried Tula on a bed of flame red fallen leaves wrapped in silk from our wedding, sprinkled with flower petals, nestled with the one toy she's had since she was a puppy that she hasn't destroyed, her baby, surrounded by her favorite treats, an avocado right by her perfect nose. I still feel broken open, heartbroken, vulnerable, especially in this space today where I'm supposed to present as professional, expert, and confident. I don't feel this way often, but I have a lot this year, this year of breaking open. And I want to stay in that space of discomfort. And I want you to invite you too into it. And especially to invite those of us that are most privileged to stay in it and to redistribute the burden of pain in our society. This has been a year without childcare this has been a year of me being in childcare. This, is me, this has been a year of great destruction and it's been a great a year of building and rebuilding like this garden that we put into our property. It's also been a year of injury. I tore um, three ligaments in my knee in January before the pandemic. So it's been a time of rest, of recuperation, but also a time of study of opening doors, of building gates and opening them. Um, most of what I've been studying are Black studies and Native studies and how they propose ways and socialities that are much older than some of the problems that um, we're experiencing right now and how we might pass through them. I've also been studying the garden and thinking about adjacency. What types of things when planted next to each other cause each other to thrive and what kinds of things want to be far apart ways that we might reorganize our society coming out of this time that might actually um, reorder some of the imbalances of power, equity, access to resources. So the garden flourished this summer all through this difficulty, but I felt like I was equally in touch with the compost, all that we need to throw away, all that we need to overturn to really get your hands in the dirt and to understand um, let's say like what we need to turn over in order to get creation to come out of destruction. In this time of study, I've also been really trying to follow the lead of um, those particularly that are leading the way in abolition. And so I'm gonna end my short presentation today by reading to you a short quote from Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Abolition is not absence, it is presence what the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's, that was just tremendous and beautiful. And I, um, I can't think of a better way to embody this moment through those images and your words that, that go alongside of them 
I think the garden as an analogy for this is so poignant and, and powerful. And so I think in many ways, that's a gift to all of us. Thank you for sharing those intimate moments from your life. Um, they really, they have a profound effect on all of us. And I can speak as a, as a provider on the front line, um, planting those gardens in your mind is, is about as close as we can get sometimes to the garden, but it's, it's a beautiful and important analogy. So thank you for that. Um, our next speaker today is Professor Paulus. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ingrid and Alan. Um, thanks so much for, for making space for this conversation today. And thank you, Karthik. That was deeply moving and inspiring. Uh, you know, the theater, um, which is my area of, of work has been uh, disrupted so deeply to its core. Uh, because as an art form, we, we really thrive on collective presence. Um, it's, it's the transmission in real time and space amongst a group of people and, and, and the ritual of coming together that is um, defining to our art form in particular. So you can imagine uh, how... Um, traumatic this has been for our artists, for all the folks that work behind the scenes to make theater happen in terms of not being able to practice what we normally do as our very core activity. So uh, I, I think um, there are a few takeaways for us coming um, into the, uh, what is it now, eight, tenth, eight, ninth month of enduring the pandemic. I, I think in the beginning, we were riding the roller coaster of um, endless scenario planning uh, of when will this end? When can we be back? When can we reopen? Um, and, and now I think we have come to terms with the fact that it will be well over a year of, of a complete stop to our practice as an industry before we can even think about um, coming back. So early on, as Ingrid um, mentioned, we made a pivot to a partnership with uh, the Chan School for Public Health. And, and I was thinking about this, um, very much about what it means to be a theater affiliated with Harvard University. That's driven a lot of our work at the ART, thinking about the research that we have access to and the thinkers we have at the university and how, of all, how all that, um, I often talk about it as a garden actually, the garden of activity at Harvard can be a catalyst for artistic activity. So not just incredible experts in fields able to comment on the plays we do, but actually how can they catalyze work? Um, and we had started talking with the School of Public Health um, about our new building. And, and some of you may or may not be aware that we have a new building project ahead of us um, in the coming years, a, a new home for the ART, a new center for research and performance at Harvard uh, in Alston. And I was speaking with uh, Professor Howard Coe, who's on the faculty at the Chan School about public health and how a cultural institution could perhaps be a beacon for public health. You know, not necessarily intuitive, how a cultural center could animate and, and lift public health as it's one of its top initiatives. But this was um, on my mind well before the pandemic. And Dr. Uh, Professor Coe had said, you must meet Joe Allen, Dr. Joseph Allen, who runs the Healthy Building Program at at the Chan School. At the time, I had no idea what a healthy building was. I never knew there was such a thing. Um, but uh, we got to be uh, colleagues, Joe and I, and he was attending some design charrettes around the concept for our new building. Flash forward to the pandemic and um, our costume shop had started to pivot to make masks uh, instead of costumes. And uh, I, I reached out to Joe to ask him about how we should be making these masks, how to be responsible and, and make sure we were following the, 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 the leading sort of health protocols of, of how to construct the best mask. And it led to a discussion of um, 
a roadmap and, and should there be a roadmap for how theaters could reopen? Um, I'm sorry if you hear that drilling, there's uh, some construction going on outside my building. I hope it's not too distracting. Um, so we uh, created a roadmap to recovering resilience for the theater, which is on our website. If anybody's interested, you go to the American Repertory Theater.org and it's featured on our website. And, and the thought there was, how could we as a theater with the privilege of being connected to a, pub, a school of public health at a major university like Harvard, what could we do in thought partnership that could be of service to the field? So the roadmap exists as um, a framework for thinking. It offers uh, uh, guiding principles. It is actually less of a, uh, a, a check book, kind of like a, 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 a safety handbook. It, it's more about how we think about the pandemic, how we think about reopening, how we need to uh, build in um, a multi-layered um, sort of risk mitigation uh, thought process around how we reopen and also how we need to stay agile and dynamic and flexible and what is our relationship to the developing science. Um, so, so that has been a, a huge part of what we've done over the last eight months. Um, educating our staff uh, has also been a big part of this, like not just uh, being confused by all the messages we get and, and we get bombarded with in media, but how can we be in relation to the science in a way that uh, helps to guide us? How do we uh, stay current with developing science? And then lastly, how do we communicate about it? And I think that's um, a role, Alan, that you mentioned about the arts. How, how are we communicating? That's what we do as artists, as theater makers. We're, we're, we're committed to communication and communication through narrative and communication um, in partnership with an audience, right? The theater never doesn't actually happen without an audience. That's, that's the incredible thing. It only happens in the space between uh, the performers and the audience. So the audience is critical. And I think the audience is going to be critical uh, in how we come out of the pandemic, how we think about reopening. And, and that's really led to some new priorities. And I'm just gonna close by saying, while this has been a disruption and, and been, um, you know, a, 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 a traumatic experience on so many levels, we've tried to use this disruption to say, we're not going back to business as usual. We, we can't. And what is the opportunity here? What can we learn? What is the learning? Um, and I, I, I do wanna lift the kind of colliding pandemics. I think that's what Darren Walker said the other day at the Ford Foundation. We're in a, in a, in a phase of co colliding pandemics and the reckoning with racial inequity in our country and racial injustice uh, is, is, an, is a public health crisis. So as we think about public health, how are we centering anti-racism institutionally? There's been a, a call to cultural institutions across the country um, to reckon with uh, predominantly white-led uh, structure and dynamics and policy. So we have um, redone our values at the ART. Uh, centering anti-racism is one of now our core values. We are in a long-term uh, process of um, rethinking our policy, our cultural, our, our, our culture, our priorities at the institution. Um, while we're not making theater, which I think um, if we were racing every day to put a show on at eight o'clock, we would have excuses not to deal with this. So uh, trying to embrace this moment, pivot, being creatively agile and uh, taking in uh, the, 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 the needs for our society for true healing. And lastly, I'll just say, we might be able to talk about it more later, what are we going to learn about access in this moment? How can we think about technology and digital reach and audience in a way uh, that is not just a stopgap during the pandemic, but, but a way that will actually um, be a whole new model for the distribution of theater, not to replace live theater. I think live theater will never go away, but how will we learn from this moment and develop, innovate and develop a new hybrid model of, of of art distribution that actually can increase access and, and increase the audience that we reach in, in new and powerful ways. 
So much to talk about, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Paulus, for those incredibly poignant words. You know, I think a lot of the conversations we've had over this course have been about using this moment to think about innovation. And clearly you had, you had already been thinking about these innovative partnerships, but obviously in this moment, it's accelerated those conversations. And such a critical intersection. I think it's something we all took for granted that there would be a space that could be held for almost a conversation between performers and the audience and this deeply human connection. And now how do we conceptualize this new pathway forward? And, and obviously you're leading in this, this moment as we think about this together. But I think in a way, as we've discussed throughout this course, you know, as, as each of these moments, there's been kind of a rupturing um, or as Alan always likes to say, the illumination of what was already there, the inequities um, that were there, there's also a moment to lean into that and think about new ways to bring, um, in this case, the arts to a much wider audience. And so I think that's a really important piece of this. So thank you for that. And we will pass um, our baton now on to Professor Tedeschi, who um, is very much in this space and thinking about all of these issues. So thank you. So it's, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for including me in this class. Um, it's such an important topic and it's one that, you know, has occupied, I think for all of us, the major part of our thinking for the last 10 months. And um, much of what I have to say really echoes what Diane has been talking about. I'll try not to make the very same points. Um, but I think one of the things that, you know, museums and cultural institutions with collections are facing is really how to think about their collections and their intersection with audience in a time when our doors are closed um, and when audiences in fact don't want to gather in public places at the moment anyway. Um, so this colliding pandemic, um, to quote Darren Walker's very apt uh, naming of the crisis we're going through has shaken cultural institutions and I'm really talking today about museums to the marrow and has forced us to rethink um, our priorities, our business and staffing models, the needs of our audiences, and in fact, uh, the needs of our workers, our employees. Um, some museums will actually not survive this crisis. Um, one of the silver linings of this crisis is that those in our field are very much in touch with each other and there's a lot of peer mentoring going on and it's been devastating to work with colleagues who you know, see that their institutions probably will not remain viable. Um, so that has been um, you know, both an upside, the closeness of the field and the way I think going forward, we will support each other much more, um, but also understanding um, that this is a moment that for some is a kind of death knell. Um, those institutions that do survive, and I think, I hope that will be most museums, uh, will have done the very difficult work, will have to do, um, the very difficult work of reassessing everything from the ground up. In the long run, this is likely to be a very good thing for the field. In fact, I think we already see that it is. Um, what's unpredictable is how our audiences will respond, um, how long this period uh, will continue, when our audiences will be ready for the new normal that we are getting ready to offer them, how they will want to look at art, and what place museum experiences will have in the priorities in their own lives. So those are all things that, you know, we're all trying to suss out, um, but which, you know, remain somewhat um, a question at this moment. Um, so the Harvard Art Museum's closed on March 12th, and we made an effort and were successful in announcing that closure with all the other major art museums in Boston and with the other Harvard museums. And that was very intentional because we felt it would be easy to confuse audiences about what was safe and what wasn't. Um, it wasn't necessarily as clear cut um, a decision as 
one now might think uh, because you know the pandemic was at early stages and there were certainly some voices including here on campus that were saying well museums are a place of solace in a crisis you should stay open you can be a place where you know people go to reflect and um, you know find inspiration and you know unfortunately we're also public gathering spaces um, and so very quickly um, all the museums realized that you know, we would be putting off the inevitable if we didn't make this decision. So we did it all at once. And, you know, within 24 hours, our staff was all working at home. Um, events were canceled, the building was secure, lights were turned off across the museums um, and everybody went home except for, of course, um, essential staff. And that is, as I mentioned, one of the critical things about museums is that, um, our budgets um, are largely taken up with the care of collections. And we have to do that whether we're open to the public or not. And that means keeping a climate controlled building, having facilities, people that check constantly for leaks or um, other kinds of climate problems, security that is there, you know, watching the alarms and doing walkthroughs um, periodically throughout the day and night. Um, so we did have to leave an essential staff um, on site. And then immediately we knew within the first week we were gonna have to pick, pivot to remote. And you know this doesn't sound like a surprise now because all of us have had to do that in one way or the other, but we immediately had to get organized about how do you keep a staff of 210 people working productively. Um, luckily, we'd had some inkling about this and we'd been practicing. Everyone was doing their meetings on Zoom even before we evacuated. So we could get up and running within that first week, but it was, you know, a much heavier lift to go from a museum that was not doing very much virtually other than, you know, having a robust website with the collections on it to a museum where, you know, every way that we would communicate would be digital. And um, so, we spent a lot of time thinking about what content we already had in hand that could be quickly repurposed and then sending out a call to everyone in the whole museum to generate more content and come up with ideas that would still paint a picture of what a museum does, um, how we can continue to engage and offer the collections in meaningful ways to an even expanded audience. Um, and the, you know, again, I'll occasionally point to a silver lining. What we quickly found here is that um, this immediately addressed an equity issue that suddenly everyone in the museum had a voice of what we would present to our public. And very interesting ideas um, came out of this, including now a kind of survey of the different jobs in museums um, and what those, you know, those professionals do. Um, including behind the scenes. So, you know, opening up to a younger audience, mostly of high school students, the whole range of professions. Um, and, you know, that allowed people from across the museum to really talk about their areas of expertise and share the parts of the collection that they care for. Um, now that we're facing a much longer, we know that we're facing a much longer period of remote work. Um, we are really pouring ourselves into the issues of communications, how we communicate with donors, with philanthropists, um, foundations, um, you know, all of these ways of communicating have shifted. We're not as events based as we were, you know, being in person used to be the best way to raise money. Now it's not really an option. Um, and of course, you know, although the money part sounds, um, less important, it actually is extremely important in making sure that we survive this crisis and that we can go back to order, you know, offering the robust experience that um, we're known for. So um, we are putting a lot of thought into how to become sustainable. Some of that is to strip away uh, less important programs, uh, things that we thought were nice to have and really getting down to the great work of the museum in this moment, uh, which certainly um, involves equity and anti-racism. It is involving rethinking the collection um, to address the changing needs that we see in our audiences. 
It also is trying to figure out what we will be like as a hybrid organization where we will continue to have a virtual presence that's very strong. Um, it's been revealing to see how much bigger an audience, but also how much more diverse an audience, including a global audience we garner with uh, virtual programs. And it's been reassuring, although museums always talk about the aura of the original object, and certainly we are devoted to that idea. Um, it's been reassuring to see that through our programs, we can offer an intimacy of experience that in the past we could only have offered to 15 people in one of our study rooms, that we can do an intimate experience for 400 people from all over the world. And we also see, we're learning about the obstacles that keep people away, physical barriers, transportation, um, accessibility issues. We're, you know, we're understanding better uh, what some of the hurdles were. So I'll leave it there and um, look forward to um, answering questions after we hear from Sarah. Sorry about the slides. No problem. Thank you so much, Professor Tedeschi. I think you know, it's hard to even conceptualize what a winter will be like here in Cambridge without those beautiful museums. It's certainly a solace, as you said, for so many of us, particularly in the darker days of winter in New England. They offer such a, a breath of fresh air and light and, and meaning and joy to so many of us. And I think the, the point that you raised about the the idea of this collision between what we had assumed was, was truly solace and still is, and these clear public health challenges that we face during this time is, is really sits at the core of, again, who we are and, and how we define ourselves. And I think from what you know, you've discussed and what other, many others who have come through our course have said, also this exciting opportunity to really think about equity, to be thinking about the collections, to be reimagining how this can be open to so many more people in, in a very different way. And so I think there's obviously a lot of um, potential in that moment. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we will turn now to our last speaker here today is Professor Lewis. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Ingrid and Alan. It's really a pleasure to be part of this gen ed course. It's a joy always to be alongside my colleagues here, and Diane, and Martha, and Karthik. It's wonderful to see you after nearly actually over a year in which so much has changed. Uh, I want to speak briefly today about, well, uh, how this moment has reanimated our understanding of what the arts can do to shift our notion of who counts and who belongs in society. Um, I say that at the start, but I should also confess that when I was invited to speak, as, as Ingrid and Alan know, I uh, initially um, declined, not out of a lack of desire to speak about this topic, but because the article uh, that I, I wrote about images in the time of COVID uh, was born of such grief that I didn't know that I might be able to actually do this. Uh, I'm happy to be here uh, today, having gone through a different stage of the grief, which brings me to a heightened sense of urgency about the topic. Um, and so let me begin by, by sharing my screen. Can you see that all right? Okay, great. My experience of the, of the pandemic began in earnest uh, when my extraordinary friend and mentor and colleague of Maurice Berger uh, died due to complications of COVID-19. It was March, I was in New York City and I was also healing from, and I'm sorry about your, your injury, Karthik, um, an injury that had me out on medical leave at Harvard. I was in a taxi which collided with another taxi and I sustained a pretty severe concussion and had been forced actually off of the computer entirely for approximately three months. Uh, and it, it made more acute my understanding of the, of the difficulties that many of us have in honoring 
health and, and honoring life above work, above our deadlines, above everything else. Maurice is someone I was so looking forward to having more time with, uh, especially the moment, given the moment we're in right now. As the New York Times obits uh, subtitle states, he was indispensable for understanding some of the most difficult issues in our field of, regarding race and equity. And what you're seeing in terms of the photograph is Maurice in the exhibition uh, that I, I asked him to organize about the work of Gordon Parks for the Vision and Justice Conference at Harvard. Every day that passed, I would think about Maurice as I would hear in New York City the wail of these ambulances every 10 minutes or so near to my apartment on the Upper West Side. And I would think about how so much of what was missing in that moment is what Maurice was known for having researched and written about, namely the function of images and visualization for getting us to understand what truly nothing else can. At the time in March, if you think back to what we were mainly seeing, it was largely statistics based evidence about the spread and the scale of the pandemic. And despite the best efforts of our uh, data visualization experts, the extraordinary graphs that we saw, what I knew as a historian, what Maurice had written about and known as well was that nothing can replicate, historically speaking, the power and force and detonation of an image, a cultural event to state what we now know the mind itself can't fully comprehend. And that is the massive scale of devastation that we're experiencing now. It's a paradox effectively that the larger the, the scale, right, of a number, the more difficult it is for the mind to actually comprehend it. So I thought about what was lost from our conversation and not having images of this devastation. And I don't know that I would have written about it without coping with uh, the grief that I was in, enduring and really feeling it at that moment because after Maurice's passing, many of uh, uh, my other friends did pass as well, that there was nothing to lose, that everything was at stake. I saw, for example, this image of the public uh, cemetery in New York City, uh, Hart Island, and at, at the time thought of it as an example of, of how our sense of the severity of the pandemic would have shifted if it was more well known. And this was the image that was included in the New York Times piece, but I should, I should state that George Steinmetz attempted to take a similar photograph and had his, um, his drone camera intercepted by the police to give you a sense of the seizure uh, around uh, this the, and the lack of visibility of this site. I thought about all the conversations Maurice and I would have had uh, about how images and other moments of time have shifted conversations when scale actually prevented uh, public discourse. I would, would have thought and would have imagined that we would speak about Frederick Douglass uh, and his understanding, having become the most photographed American man in the 19th century, of the importance of what would have seemed like a trifle in the state of that nation severing conflict, namely photographs and their force and power in the imagination, so much so that he he named his speech, Pictures in Progress, about this idea um, by including this term, thought pictures, right? He wasn't just interested in the mastery of, of an image or the work of it, one photographer or another, but the phenomenon, the broader phenomenon of how it is that we can imagine ourselves anew after the critical force of, of an image greeting us. And Sojourner Truth thought of this as well. I know we would have considered, as Maurice has, has written about, FSA photography and the way in which, for example, Dorothea Lange's migrant mother galvanized the public to actually understand the collective conditions of the Great Depression by focusing on here one mother with her children in a pea picking camp. And the results and spread and distribution of this image did result in relief efforts happening in Nipomo, California. We might have thought of it in the context of the civil rights movement and consider the work of Gordon Parks himself. Uh, on the right, you're seeing the Brown versus Board of Education sort of related image of the Kenneth Clark doll test taking place and showing that young boy choosing that white doll with his hand, though with his eyes still engaging with, with the black doll on the left. On the left of your screen, you're seeing another image by Dorothea Lange documenting Japanese internment and 
the way in which people were rendered objects, tagged for removal and sent to internment camps. Uh, a fact, a phenomenon that couldn't have been explained, understood, or made more tragic uh, any other way. What the pandemic did in the end uh, for me in thinking about here the term collision, though I don't love it as much because of having experienced one myself uh, of the uh, pandemics is forced me to it in my own uh, work and scholarship think about what we actually are now forced to address, which is the ground of all of this. I've been uh, in the lap since I guess now May. Um, finishing up another book uh, about which uh, an article has just come out that's focusing on what I'm in considering as groundwork projects. What I've what I've noticed over the course of the pandemic are sort of the phenomenon of the rollout of projects that interrogate this figure ground relationship. What is the ground on which we all collectively stand? Here's a, an image of the late Congressman John Lewis looking out uh, towards the White House on a street that has been named for the Black Lives Matter movement, um, celebrating the, the actual naming of it instantiated on the actual ground as one example. But by this, I also mean works by Hank Willis Thomas. Here, I'm offering you one example, surrounding the EJI Memorial, in which we see these outstretched hands and this kind of universal gesture and sign of surrender, um, and but bodies that are that are sunken into the grounds as a way to conceptually and figuratively consider the the um, in the systemic conditions that limit freedom that limit mobility. I've been thinking about this in the context of Amy Sherald's excuse me Amy Sherald's work. Um, if you surrender to the air, you can ride it uh, in which you're seeing the suspended figure precariously placed seeming to uh, inhabit uh, at once a place of respite and uh, kind of reward the sky, but also a place of danger. How has he arrived on that beam and what is actually supporting the ground beneath him? Gehende Wiley has long considered this figure ground relationship, but with renewed energy at the time of uh, the pandemic, just before he had debuted Rumors of War, a piece that is born of um, uh, the composite face of six African-American men who have died in uh, states with stand your ground laws. I, I mention all of this and I can conclude with this other Hank Willis Thomas piece because what the pandemic has allowed us to also interrogate are the conditions that have been born of the hypervisibility of racial injustices on American ground. And these artists that I've listed, and there are many others, um, create a set of aesthetic strategies through which the literal and figurative meaning of ground can be destabilized productively. We use that term, stand your ground law, without fully interrogating it in either the Heideggerian sense, in terms of reason. What are the grounds for this, we often say, right, in the context of law. Uh, but to think about Karthik's idea of the garden, I, I want to think quite literally about how artists are physically interrogating the ground itself. And it's a, um, a project that, of course, is asking the discipline to make more methodological room for, for the engagement with the social world that these artists have always had, but now more acutely. And it's, and it's certainly my um, conscious attempt to, to do what felt uh, premature when Maurice Berger died. Um, but I now see is, is my charge and, and that is uh, to pick up the baton off of him. So, so thank you very much. Professor Lewis, thank you so much. And <clears throat> um, I'm so grateful to you for your courage and resilience in being here today. And so it really means a lot to us. I'm sure it means a lot to our students who are in this virtual space. I just have to say, I've found today's presentations just deeply moving, you know, far beyond even my high expectations for this session. And I have in my work on disease become convinced that one can't understand disease and suffering and epidemics without understanding the arts. But all four of you have made such a determined and impassioned case for that 
that I, in a way, I'm at a loss for words. I'm just inspired by um, all of these discussions um, today. I guess I would say, as I was reflecting and listening, you know, I think together, all of you have captured a very powerful sense of pain and loss. It's obviously losses of people who have been so important to us or that we've loved, but loss of the ability to make art, to bring people into the world of arts. And this is a very sad and sobering time, but what I also took from all of your presentations is the significance of resistance and the potential for resilience. And the reason I would say I'm inspired is because I know that the arts will be resilient and they will be responsive and they will look different than they looked before the pandemic. But there, there's been this crisis of the disruption and today's talks more than anything, honestly, I've heard in the course, I'm very hopeful about vaccines but there will be arts and, um, and I'm very interested and curious and eager to see what they look like and what they represent. And one of the things we've been talking about in the course has been this intersection of what's come to be called racial reckoning, but really reflects centuries of oppression and dispossession and Today, I think I better understand um, in a way that I've struggled with the relationship of the Black Lives Matter movement to the COVID pandemic. And that's a complicated set of relationships and meanings and activities. But today's session really, you know, I think in a very powerful and human way, in a way that maybe only the arts can, um, help me understand that better. So I'm incredibly grateful to all four of you. And we have time now for students to engage with the really powerful things that you have spoken about. So let's get some students into the discussion now. 